Anybody standing for the jury? Everybody can see it, please. May I proceed, Ms. Duke? Um, so before we took a break, I asked you whether Ms. Brandy Peters had called uh, Department of Revenue to check on the status of her case against Henry Segura um, and the payments during the week leading up to November 19th, 2010. Uh, while we were on a break, did you, were you able to review um, a document uh, that refreshed your recollection about those events? Uh, yes. Okay. And was your rec uh, was your ref <laughs> Were you able to remember when that happened? <laughs> Got yes, some she, tongue twisters over here. <laughs> she uh, contacted our customer contact center on uh, November 17th of 2010. Okay. So she called your call service center, you said? Our call. We call them our customer contact center, but it's our call center. Our call center mm -hmm. on November 17th, 2010. Correct. <laughs> No Sir, just real briefly, I wanted to, uh, to ask you about one of the sections referenced by Ms. Dugan in the, the documents that you were just going over with her, indicating that, um, that the administrative order, as it was finalized, was going to be in place with those terms and less modified by a court of competent jurisdiction, correct? Correct. And so that's something that can happen. An individual uh, generally can uh, go to court, and it's possible to have the monthly amount, the total amount, or even paternity altogether waived by the court. That's correct. And the court's order would supersede the administrative order that you guys came to, correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, each, uh, each child support case, that, by which I mean to say for every child a, a, for whom child support is awarded, that's a different case within your agency, correct? That's correct. And you were asked to focus on Ms. Peters and Mr. Segura's paternity and, and child support case as it related to Javante Segura only, correct? Yes. You weren't asked to look into any prior child support order that had been put in place um, dating back to 2006 or so with his other child, correct? Uh, no, sir. Okay. So you wouldn't have any personal knowledge about that? Not about that. Not okay. today. Now, if, if a respondent has a prior child support judgment in effect at the time a new administrative order is finalized, um, it's possible that he would still be subject because of the earlier order to all of the same negative consequences that you were just talking about with Ms. Dugan, is that correct? That's correct. So the process for any earlier child support judgment would proceed in exactly the same way. You'd go through the process that you described and then potential penalties could be imposed depending on what the respondent's response was. Yes. Okay. So specifically as it relates to a tax lien, for example, where the IRS intercepts uh, any tax refund, if there's already a child support judgment in excess of $20,000 hanging out there, then it would already be taken and potentially divvied up based on a pro rata share to the two people who have child support judgments. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And similarly, same thing with a lien against real property or personal property like a vehicle. Same principle. That's uh, correct. It could be lien based on the earlier child support judgment, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, with respect to travel, again, if it's any, any prior judgment above $2,500, that, that respondent would still be subject to the travel ban irrespective of any new child support judgment issued, correct? Correct. Um, and same thing, with, well, actually, with, with respect to motion for contempt and going to jail, I'm sorry, I, I, was, I was before <laughs> I, somebody blew a dog whistle, I was about to ask you about going to jail. You indicated that uh, when somebody goes to jail, when they're held in contempt, they'll, they'll be held until an amount is paid that's uh, set by the court. Is that correct? That's correct. So somebody can get out of jail by making a partial payment, right? Correct. As determined by the judge. As determined by the judge, yeah. Um, same kind of question with respect to a 
suspended driver's license. It could be suspended for a prior child support judgment, correct? It can. And the, and the driver's license suspended can be lifted at the discretion of the court based on a partial payment, correct? Correct. Um, same thing with professional licenses. Um, that can be suspended based on an earlier child support judgment, correct? Yes. Um, and same deal with recreation. Go, go ahead and, and try to talk into the mic, there, Mr. Prince. If, yes, sir. Uh, if it backs up again, I'll hit it a little quicker. Thank you. <laughs> um, recreational licenses, you spoke about that as well. Same deal with that. Recreational licenses can be suspended based on a prior child support judgment as well, correct? Correct. Um, with, with respect to professional licenses, if, uh, if a, defend, a respondent, I guess it is in the child support context, if a respondent doesn't need a professional license in order to do his or her job, um, the, the preventing of getting a, a, a professional license through some state agency wouldn't ha have any impact on their earning potential, correct? Uh, correct. All right, and then with respect to um, garnishment, I guess the first question is same as all the others. Um, garnishment can be awarded based on a prior child support judgment, correct? That's correct. And then um, the other question or line of questions I was going to ask about garnishment is that if a defend, uh, if a respondent is uh, an independent contractor who doesn't have the same employer all the time and just moves from job to job, that can make it difficult, if not impossible, to garnish his wages, correct? That's correct. Um, and same thing without a state. It's virtually impossible if somebody's bouncing around from state to state as an independent contractor, right? That's correct. Um, same deal with getting paid under the table. If, if, a def if a respondent gets paid under the table in cash, that wouldn't be anything that unless it's deposited to an account, you guys could do anything with that, correct? That's correct. Thank you. I have no further questions. Redirect. So um, defense asked you that, you know, these orders, it says that they can be modified by a court. Um, and that sometimes does happen, right? It does, yes. Okay. Um, but when someone goes into court to contest paternity or because they want their, the amount that they're supposed to pay, be pay or supposed to pay be lowered, um, does that always happen in court? Um, no. To even qualify for it, um, you have to present uh, evidence that would meet the statute that allows us to do the modification. Okay. So it would be his burden to explain to the court and show evidence why his payment should be lowered or he shouldn't have to pay at all or those things. Correct. Okay. And just as any court proceeding, is any of that guaranteed? It all depends on how the evidence comes out and what the judge decides? Yes. And the defense asked you about these writs that Department of Revenue can ask judges to place on um, people who haven't paid their child support and all the other enforcement actions have taken place. They still haven't paid. So you do the writ of bodily, bodily attachment where they get put in jail until they pay a certain amount um, to get out. Okay, so my question about that, he says, if you even make a partial payment, you can just get out of jail. I mean, these writs are normally, normally at least seven, several hundred dollars, right? It's not just like, okay, you're in jail till you can pay 10 bucks and then you get out, right? Uh, correct, it's really based off of what your obligation is. Right, it's a percentage of your obligation and your monthly payment. And if you're if you owe twenty three thousand dollars, that's a substantial amount, right? Uh, yes. Okay. He talked about how if you're an independent contractor, you're moving around, you're getting paid under the table, you're you know you're not actually getting paychecks. That those are all ways that people can try to circumvent the child support program and and um, not get their not get their wages garnished, not get things taken out of their paycheck. Um, but at the end of the day, if they're not paying child support, they still have a property lien on them. They don't have a ability to drive legally. They can get put in jail, right? That's correct. Okay. And they wouldn't have a professional license or certification to be doing their job um, 
legally or in a way that would help them get the most money they could. Right. Okay. Thank you. And you have a question of this with All right. If not, you may step down. Do we need to keep him any further? I'd like him to remain under the rule. All right. Remain subject to recall, please, Mr. Wiggins. But you can go about your business. Okay. Call your next witness, Ms. Dugan. Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. This time, David called you all in Brown. Okay. <coughs> Morning. Good morning. Can you please introduce yourself to the jurors? My name is Joellen Brown. I uh, am a retired crime laboratory analyst from FDLE. Okay. And can you please spell your first, middle, and last name to Madam Reporter? J O capital E L L E N Brown B R O W E. And Ms. Brown, you said you were retired from Florida Department of Law Enforcement yes. as a crime analyst. Yes. Did you have a specialty there at the crime lab? Yes, I worked in the um, DNA analysis department, forensic biology, and I was a senior crime laboratory analyst. Okay. Um, before you retired, how long did you work there? I worked there 19 years. All right. And I assume in order to do such things like a DNA uh, analysis, you had some sort of training and experience that allowed you to do that? Yes, I have a master's degree from The Ohio State University in uh, genetics and pathology. And I also did training at FDLE for 13 months. And then obviously during those 19 years, I'm assuming you kept up with your uh, any ongoing advancements, if you will, of DNA and that in the study of DNA, correct? Yes, we were required to do uh, continuing education every year. Okay. And during the course of those 19 years, had you had an occasion to come into court and offer your testimony as it relates to DNA analysis and comparisons? Yes, I did. Okay, approximately how many times do you know? Approximately 80 times. Eight zero? Eight zero. We're on this time at 10 of the witness. Any word out? No, Your Honor. You may proceed. All right, so let's kind of, if we can, do a little education about DNA and how it works. Okay? So um, you deal with, first of all, what is DNA? DNA is the substance that every person has in their cells and other living organisms as well, which um, codes for various uh, aspects of yourself, uh, what you look like, your hair color, your eye color, um, also things you can't see, like your blood type, whether you can produce insulin or not. Okay. And how is it you get certain, and I understand there's markers, and we'll get to those a little bit more as we go, but you get certain markers. Um, uh, that makes up your DNA and helps you identify someone, correct? Correct. Okay. How do you get, how does that person get those? Uh, you inherit this DNA from your parents. Half of your DNA comes from your mother and half comes from your father. Okay. All right. So in doing DNA analysis, um, at some point you uh, identify, I guess, those markers, um, and each person is specific to a marker, Correct. Um, it, depending upon which type of analysis you're doing, uh, there are various numbers of markers that can be looked at. And these are parts of the DNA that don't necessarily code for anything. They're just basically spacer DNA. And um, we used to use a kit called Profiler Plus and Cofiler, two kits. And these were, uh, would help us to identify 13 different areas. Okay, and that, that profiler and co-filer kit, so you were just, or co-filer plus, I think you said, um, right. and um, that was the one that was being utilized back in uh, 2010? That's correct. Okay. So that was the one that you based your analysis on as it relates to this particular case? For the most part, yes. Okay. All right. Um, so what is that? What is that? Um, these are called STRs or short tandem repeats, which means that throughout your uh, DNA, you have areas which have repeats of little pieces of DNA. Like I said, they don't really code for anything that we know of, mostly. 
and you can have various numbers of these repeats. So at these 13 different areas of your genes. And those are called loci, correct? Um, each particular one would be located somewhere, so the plural of that is loci, yes. Locus okay. or loci for plural. Okay. And um, so when I would determine a type, for instance, of one of your uh, types at a particular marker, you might have 10 repeats, and you inherited that particular piece of DNA, let's say, from your mother, and maybe from your father, you inherited 12 repeats. So your uh, type at that particular marker would be 10, 12. And we, a person either has one or two peaks, and the only reason you would have, and we call them peaks because that's what they look like when we do the analysis. They look like upside down ice cream cones or very skinny mountains, if you would. Um, a person might have only one at a locus because they might inherit the same one uh, from their mother and their father. Let's say you, you inherited a 10 from your mother and a 10 from your father, so that would show up in our analysis as only one peak, of a 10, and your type would be 10, 10. And just for illustration purposes at this time, um, this is what you're talking about with the peaks and the locations, correct? Yes, that's correct. And we'll get into the analysis a little bit later, but that's what we're talking about. These are the little ice cream cones you're talking about? Correct. Okay. What is an allele? An allele is um, uh, whatever kind of gene you can have at that particular locus. So the example I just gave you, 10 is an allele and 12 is an allele. Okay, so those are those ice cream cones you're talking about. Is an, each one of them is an allele? Correct. Okay. All right. Now, how do you go about testing to determine this DNA and get these alleles at these loci? Well, first, if I was looking at an item of evidence, I would um, determine if there was something, some biological fluid there, such as uh, semen or saliva or blood. Then I would take a small sample of that and do a chemical extraction process to get the DNA out of the cells. Basically, it's just breaking up the cells. Um, then I would quantitate it to find out how much I was able to get out of that sample. And then I would use a certain amount to do what we call PCR, or polymerase chain reaction. And basically that's just like a, a Xerox machine making copies of this DNA so that there's enough so that we can detect it in a, a genetic analyzer. Okay. And the genetic analyzer you're talking about, that I assume that's some sort of big machine? Yes, it is a big machine. Okay, and it basically will look at these and, and give you the information contained that you're just talking about regarding the allele, correct? Yes. Um, in the process of PCR, uh, a fluorescent dye is incorporated into each piece of DNA that we are making copies of. And then the machine can actually detect those fluorescent colors. Okay. Now, you talked about... Um, see if there's anything useful or amounts that you can do comparison. Are there issues with that? Um, yes. There might be some DNA samples that have very little DNA and they might not be able to be amplified by PCR. Okay. So just because you can't find a result or something along those lines when it comes to DNA doesn't mean there's not DNA or something left there. It's just the numbers are so low you really can't make a determination as to what it means. That may be so, yes. Okay. Is there any way when you do your testing to make any determination about when DNA is left at a particular location? No, there's no way to tell that. Okay. Um, now, is it ever possible to get a situation where there's DNA of more than one person contained into a swab that you talked about earlier? Yes, uh, that happens quite a lot when we get um, forensic samples, like say from a doorknob. Um, we can do testing for touch as well as biological fluids. So if someone were to swab a doorknob, it's quite likely that I would get a mixture of DNA from more than one person. Okay. And is it likely that you could get DNA left on that doorknob from different times? Yes. So one person touches it on Friday, next person touches it Saturday morning, one person touches it on Thursday morning, could contain a mixture of all those above. Yes, it could. Now let's turn a little bit, if we can, to this particular case. Um, not a little bit, I guess we're going to turn a lot to this particular case. 
Um, as it relates to this case, did you obtain a buckle swab as it relates to Javante Segura, Tamaya and Tanaya uh, Peters, Brandy Peters, Henry Segura, and Antonio Anthony? And what was the last one? Antonio Anthony? Yes. Okay. What is, first of all, what is a buckle swab? A buckle swab is a swabbing inside your cheek, and that there are loose cells there, and that usually gives us a very good sample in order to determine the type that the person has. So that, that would be our standard or our known to compare to other things from a crime scene. Okay. And then how do you go about developing that swab? In exactly the same way as we would with forensic uh, samples. Okay. So it's the same thing. It's just you know where that particular one came from, and more than likely because it's taken from the inner cheek, it's of a very specific person, so it's not a mixture. Is that fair to say? That's correct. And as you said, that's the idea is to get a standard for further comparisons. Yes. Okay. And did you do a comparison of all those photos? I mean, I'm sorry, I don't want to get into comparisons. Did you do a, I guess if it's chart of uh, all those persons' alleles and uh, markers, if you will? Yes. Okay. Your Honor, may I you a okay. please? This one has not been marked, Your Honor. This Madam Clerk, we have 148. Previously marked or now marked for state exhibit purposes 148. Actually, take a look at that particular item, please. You recognize that? Yes. What does that appear to be? Um, this is the um, set of DNA analyses that I did on uh, Brandy Peters, Tamaya Tanaya Peters, Javante Segura, Antonio Anthony, and Henry Segura. And it lists all 13 of those markers that I spoke about um, that we analyzed for. And does that appear to be an accurate recording of those findings that you, the development that you made from those public swap those persons? Yes, this has my initials on it, and this is from my report. Your Honor, this time I have to say to do the number 148. Any objection? No, Your Honor. 148 will be admitted. And permission to publish. You may. Maya and Tanaya appear to have the same numbers across the board. Why is that? Um, they were twins, and by doing this DNA analysis, I can have proved that they are identical twins. Okay. So this basically says that these were, in fact, identical twins because they are identical on all those markers we previously talked about, correct? That's correct. And then when we're talking about the alleles and the numbers at each loci, this right here are all the different loci? Correct. And then this would be the allele numbers there. So at VWA, for instance, Brandy Peters would be a 1518. That's correct. That's what we're talking about. So these are the little peaks, the upside down ice cream cones. Correct. Okay. All right. Were you asked to make determinations as to who the father of Javante Segura and uh, Tamaya and Tanaya Peters were? I was asked to determine Javante's father. Okay. And did you make that determination? I was asked to determine if Henry Segura was Javante's father. It wasn't. Yes. So you, was Henry Segura was not the father of Tamaya and Tanaya, correct? That's correct. Okay. And that was, in fact, Antonio Anthony was their father, correct? I didn't do actual testing to uh, report that, but I can tell by looking at their types that the girls share at least one allele with him on all of the low side. And which would indicate that he was the father. Yes. All right. So let's take a look, uh, if we can, um, start looking at some of the DNA that you analyzed um, during the course of this particular case. Fair to say it wasn't all done at one time, correct? That's correct. All right. Um, if we can, did you were you asked to do an examination 
as to Tallahassee Police Department Exhibit Number 1 and 2, which corresponds with State's Exhibit 9 and 10. I believe they are the exterior rear door swab and the interior rear door swab uh, from the home. Yes. Okay. And do, were you able to make a determination as to any DNA presence on those locations? Have to look at my notes. Feel free. I don't expect you to know all this off the top of your head. I was able to develop a partial profile from um, the the rear door swab and uh, a complete DNA profile from the interior rear door knob. Okay. And what is a partial DNA? That means out of those 13 markers, I was not able to get a development of a type at all 13. And what was your determination as to a TBD exhibit number one, states exhibit number nine, the exterior rear door swab? Um, it matches Brandy Peters. Okay. And as to TBD number two, states exhibit number 10, the interior rear door swab? It matches Brandy Peters. Okay. All right. Is there any sign of a mixture there? No. All right, next let's turn to the front door if we can. Uh, so I'm going to start with Tallahassee Police Department case uh, identification number 72, uh, which is state's identification 81. Did you make any findings there? Yes, and there I found a mixture of DNA. Okay, and what would that mixture, were you able to make any determination about who? When we have a mixture, sometimes we can determine who is the major contributor. In other words, they have very large peaks on the electropharogram, and then there's another, per if another person is present, they might have smaller peaks and they would be the minor donor. And in this case, um, Brandy Peters was the major contributor, and I couldn't determine a type for the minor contributor, but it was male. What do you mean you couldn't determine a type? What does that mean? It was so little DNA, the only um, allele that showed up was the Y uh, at the sex determination. All right. And going back to that chart we have, and obviously this isn't the uh, comparison chart for that particular one, but by that you're talking about this line right here with the X's? That's correct. It's called right. amylogenin. And that tells you whether someone is male or female? Correct. A female will have two X's and a male will have an X and a Y. Okay. So in this particular case, as it relates to that interior front door handle, you were able to determine the major contributor was Brainy and the minor was a male, but nothing further than that. That's correct. So even if, it, uh, even if there was a buckle swab of a known individual, there's no way to make a determination whether that person would have been there, or it was that person's DNA in any way, shape, or form, correct? Except that they'd be male, yes. Other than the male. So I could have been there. Yes, you could. Okay. Next turn to uh, also the front door, states exhibit number 82, TPD exhibit number 73, which is the interior deadbolt of that front door. Did you make a determination there? Yes, and I determined there was a mixture of DNA there. Um, Brandy and the girls were included in that mixture. However, there's one foreign DNA to both of those. Uh, both the girls and Brandy, at one of the markers, which is BWA. Okay. And did that give any, in, so that you have one marker that is foreign to them, correct? Correct. Right. However, there was no Y, so I cannot say that that would be male. All right, so you don't know if it's male or female, but one marker was different. Well, I know that there's no Y, so that would indicate that it's probably a female. 
Okay. Um, and is that the one low side that is different than the the? No, that wouldn't be different. So I'm sorry. I'm I'm misunderstanding your. You know that there is Tamaya Tanaya, Brandy Peters, and a Y, an additional Y. There is no Y on that one, no. Okay. So how do you know that that would be a female versus a male? Since there is no Y. There's only X showing up. Okay. All right. Uh, but no determination can be made as it relates to the minor because there's only one loci, correct? That's different? Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Let's, let's turn to the uh, front door still. States exhibit number 90, TBD exhibit number 74, which is the exterior door handle. So the exterior door handle of the, um, of the front door. Okay. Did you make any determinations as it relates to that? Yes, and I found a mixture on that door handle as well. Okay. And what um, were your determination? Brandy and the girls are included, uh, and there is a Y present, so there is a male included as well. Okay. Um, so you know it's a male, once again, but that's pretty much all we know, correct? Sorry. We know it's a male that had been touched at some point or another, but that's all we know. Correct. Okay. And again, uh, no way to say when somebody touches it, leaves that DNA or anything along those lines as it relates to these, especially these doors, correct? That's correct. Okay. All right. So now let's look if we can um, and go into the house. Um, state's exhibit number 11, Tallahassee Police Department number 18, uh, swabbing from the rear curtain. Did you make any determination as it relates to that swabbing? Yes. <clears throat> I determined that there was blood present and that I got an entire DNA profile which matches Brandy Peters. So there's blood on the rear curtain and that blood is Brandy Peters is what your determination was. That's correct. Um, next, let's turn. Let's kind of let's talk about the things that are found out in the hallway for the most part, if we can, at this point. Uh, State's exhibit number eighteen, uh, tell us, police department number nineteen, a swab of the exterior of the hallway closet door. Yes, I was able to get an entire profile from uh, that sample, which also matches Brandy Peters. Did that indicate blood? Yes. So we know blood was taken from that swab of the exterior hallway door um, and that it was, in fact, Brandy Peters. Yes. Blood. Okay. Next would be states number 19, Tallahassee Police number 20, exterior hallway closet door. Um, again, a second swabbing from that same door. Yes, I was able to determine that there was blood present and the DNA matches Brandy Peters. States number 20, Tallahassee Police Center number 21, a swabbing from the south wall of the hallway closet. Yes, I was able to determine blood present on the chemical indications of blood for the, that swab, and I was able to determine an entire profile which matched Brandy Peters. And these entire profiles, we're not talking about there's a mixture. It is, in fact, just a, as you've said, the markers, 13 markers, Brandy Peters, correct? Correct. State's exhibit number 53, Tallahassee Police Department number 22, the exterior of Javante's bedroom door. Yes, um, there was blood present on that sample, and I did get 13 markers, which match Brandy Peters, but there is a Y also present. Okay. Uh, anything further that would give any indication to who that person was other than maybe it was a male? No. So at that point, you have a mixture where you've got a male and a female, but the only DNA there that you were able to determination was, in fact, Brandy Peters. That's correct. And it gave indications for blood? Yes. Okay. State's Exhibit number 54, Tallahassee Police Department number 23. Again, Javante Segura's bedroom door. I was able to determine that there are chemical indications of blood on that sample, and I did get results at all 13 markers, which match Brandy Peters. 
However, there is a Y present and one foreign allele at one of the markers. And what does that mean? The Y with one foreign allele at one of the markers. Uh, well, there's a Y present, so I know that there's some male contri contribution. And at one of the markers, there is something foreign to Brandy. Okay. Um, when you're doing a comparison, you, you, uh, we've obviously heard you do 13 markers when making comparisons for Brandy Peters. Is there a problem with any kind of identificational aspect as it relates to just one loci? Well, the problem would be um, when we do a match, we give statistics to say uh, how significant the match is. If there's only one locus, it's very, very low statistics in terms of maybe one in two people have this this marker. So. so having that one marker there really doesn't enable you to narrow down anything other than it could be maybe one out of two people in the world. Um, well, I was making up the number, but it, it is very low. Yeah. Correct. Um, and there's also a problem if it's a very, very low allele, which we can detect, but it's really not above our callable limits. So therefore, I was, would not be allowed to use that allele to make uh, statistical determinations. Okay. We'll get into all the callable stuff in a little bit. Um, let's just kind of go through where we are still. Uh, States Exhibit number 54, Tallahassee Police Department number 24. Uh, again, another swabbing from Javante's bedroom door. Yes, there was blood present on that sample, and I developed all 13 markers, which matches Brandy Peters. Okay. States Exhibit number 56, Tallahassee Police Department number 25, the south door frame of Mr. Uh, Javante. Uh, Segura's bedroom door. There was blood present on that sample. I developed all 13 markers and it matches Brandy Peters. Okay. Uh, States exhibit number 21 and uh, Tallahassee Police Department number 26. The wall just south of Javante's bedroom. There was blood present on that sample. I developed all 13 markers and it matches Brandy Peters. And then States Exhibit number 22, Tallahassee Police Department number 27, the wall across from the hallway bathroom. So. There was blood present on that sample as well. I developed all 13 markers, and it matches Brandy Peters. States Exhibit number 29, uh, which also Tallahassee Police Department number 29, the south door frame of the master bedroom. There was present, uh, blood present on that sample. I developed all 13 markers, and they match Brandy Peters. Okay. States exhibit number 23, Tallahassee Police Department number 30, which would be the hallway across the hallway, the wall, the hallway across from Javante's bedroom. I was able to determine blood on that sample, and I developed all 13 markers, which matches Brandy Peters. Okay. And the fitted sheet, uh, states exhibit number 37, Tallahassee Police Department number 37, uh, fitted sheet from the master bed. Did you make any determination as it relates to that? Yes, there was blood present on that sample, and I developed all 13 markers, and they br match Brandy Peters. Okay. So essentially what we've talked about is we've looked at a bunch of different samples from this particular hallway, and they all give indications for blood and all appear to be, or all complete, uh, the blood indicates it is, in fact, Brandy Peters' blood that is found on all those swabbings down this hallway. And you have two different locations that have a, a, an additional um, allele that is foreign to uh, Miss Peters. Is that basically a summary of what we're talking about? Yes. Okay. Sorry. New microphone. Well, you also asked to make determinations as it relates to items and swabbings that were found from Brandy Peters herself. Yes. Um, when you're dealing with a amount of blood in a bloody scene, as if we are dealing with in this particular case, is there a danger of, I guess, washout, if you will, from the from the blood of the person that, in this particular case, had been murdered? Um, if we're talking about the blood of a particular person, maybe overlapping or being on top of 
maybe touch DNA from another person or some kind of uh, substance that has just very little DNA, then the person who is the major contributor, usually from the blood stain, um, will be there in such a large amount in the sample that it is true that I might not be able to detect a second person. Okay. So let's take a look at Ms. Uh, Peters then, if we can. State's Exhibit number 130A, uh, Telex Police Department number 46, which will be a swabbing from the right thumbnail for Ms. Peters. Did you make a finding as it relates to that? Um, these were nail scrapings Okay. from the right thumb. Um, I developed all 13 markers, and um, it was matching Brandy Peters. Nothing for him. In 103B, uh, tell us police department number 47 from the right index finger. I developed all 13 markers from the nail scrapings, and there was a, uh, it matched Brandy Peters, but there was a foreign donor below our callable limits. Okay, so what does that mean, below our callable limits? Well, um, those peaks have to be a certain height in order for us to use them because below a, cert, uh, a certain height, they're not reliable because they might have another peak that goes with them that didn't amplify at all. It's just basically, we don't have enough DNA. And our analytical threshold was 50. Uh, um, the um, scale that's used is called RFUs, or relative fluorescent units, having to do with that fluorescent dye that's tagging the DNA. And the callable limit is 100. So if there's something between 50 and 100, we put a star on it saying, well, it's there, but we can't really do much of anything with it. We can't use it to include people, for instance. And that's the FDLE standard, correct? That's a threshold that's set by Florida Department of Law Enforcement in the lab analysis? That was our threshold, yes. Okay. All right. So you have Brandy Peters present as well as possibly another person, but it's too low for you to be able to utilize it because of the low RFUs. That's correct. Okay. Uh, 103D, Tallahassee Police Department number 49, the right ring finger. I was able to get a partial DNA profile from those nail scrapings and they match Brandy Peters. Okay. 103E, Tallahassee Police Department number 50, the right little finger. I was able to develop all 13 markers, and it matches Brandy Peters with one foreign donor at one locus. One foreign allele, I should say, at that locus. Again, that one would make it... Um, statistically um, unreliable, if you will, for any kind of matching purposes because it's one foreign one. Yes, this foreign one was also between 50 and 100, so it would not so, be used for statistics. So not only is it uh, one, only one, but it's also the low RFUs as well? Correct. 103F, uh, uh, Tallahassee Police Department number exhibit, or exhibit number 51, the left thumbnail from Brandy Peters. There was blood present on this sample, and I did develop all 13 markers, which match Brandy <coughs> Peters. Okay. 103G, number 50, uh, Tallahassee Police Department, number 52, the left index finger. I was able to develop all 13 markers, which matches Brandy Peters, and there is one foreign uh, allele at one locus. Again, between 50 and 100, so it's a star. Uh, State's exhibit number 103J, Tallahassee Police Department exhibit number 55, the left little finger. There was blood present on this sample. I developed all 13 markers, and it matches Brandy Peters with nothing foreign. 103K, uh, Tallahassee Police Department number 56, a swab from the left neck of Brandy Peters. There was blood present on this sample, and it was very, very partial. I got an X only, an amylogenin, and nothing else. 
So even though you've got blood from the neck of Brandy Peters, who is essentially covered in blood in this particular case, you still may only get a partial DNA sample for your determination. Is what yes. Okay. What are some of the factors that go into that aspect? Why would that occur? Degradation, for one thing. Um, What's this, that? This probably did not happen in this case, but if it was something that was, for instance, out in the open, out in the woods, for instance, dirt can cause degradation of DNA. Um, excessive sunlight or excessive heat, which we have a lot of around here, uh, can cause degradation of DNA. That probably didn't happen in this case. But other substances that might be present, for instance, on a neck, there might be lotion or perfume or something like that, can interfere with DNA analysis. Okay. Uh, States Exhibit number 103L, uh, Tallahassee Police Department number 57, a swab from the right neck of Brandy Peters. There was blood present on this sample, and I developed all 13 markers with, um, it matches Brandy Peters with nothing foreign. 103M, Tallahassee Police Department number, uh, Exhibit number 58, the back of the left hand from Brandy Peters. Uh, this sample had blood, and I developed all 13 markers, which matches Brandy Peters. 103N, as in Nancy, uh, Tallahassee Police Department number 59, um, a swab from the left palm of Brandy Peters. This sample had blood present, and I developed all 13 markers, which matched Brandy Peters. 103O, Tallahassee Police Department number 60, the swab from the back of the right hand from Brandy Peters. This also had blood present and I developed all 13 markers matched Brandy Peters. Okay. And 103 P, Tallahassee Police Department number 61, again a swab of the right palm from Brandy Peters. Um, this sample had blood present. I developed all 13 markers and they matched Brandy Peters. Okay. So essentially what we're talking about is all the swabbing and scrapings as it related to Brandy Peters herself uh, indicated they were in fact blood. Obviously the scrapings, only one of those did, um, or excuse me, two of those did. Um, and they were in fact Brandy Peters. And on two of the scrapings, you had a foreign alleles, one particular low side, low RFUs. Is that correct? Correct. Next, take a look at, if we can, State's Exhibit number 73, Tallahassee Police Department number uh, 65, a swabbing from the carpet in the living room. Um, that sample had blood present, and I had developed all 13 markers, which match Brandy Peters. State's Exhibit number 74, uh, Tallahassee Police Department number 66. This was a swab of blood on the carpet, suspected blood. It did have chemical indications for blood. I developed a partial profile which matched Brandy Peters. State's exhibit number 75, um, Tallahassee Police Department number 67, uh, suspected a swab from suspected blood on the tile. This sample was also positive for blood. I developed 13 markers and they matched Brandy Peters. So essentially what we're talking about then, as we would expect um, in looking at the scenes here, uh, the carpet in the living room and um, the blood on the tile is Brandy Peters. Correct. Next turn to State's Exhibit number 77, Tallahassee Police Department number 70, which is the handle of the shovel in the living room. A 
Okay, this sample was positive for blood. I developed all 13 markers and it matched Brandy Peters. Next date's exhibit number 76, Tallahassee Police Department number 71, also from the red shovel. I was given the actual shovel rather than a sample from it. So I took samples myself. I took seven different samples. And the reason is um, there was blood positive on this shovel. And I wanted to determine also if someone was handling it, the shovel, I mean. So um, blood was positive, and I swabbed the top and back of the handle. I did develop all 13 markers from that sample, which matched Brandy Peters. Okay. Did you, in any of your swabbings uh, of the shovel, um, make an identification as to Brandy Peters' DNA that was not blood positive? I tested several areas for blood on that uh, shovel. The areas that were negative were the front of the handle and the side of the handle, uh, the back screw in the handle, the front screw and the back of the blade. Then these areas were positive for blood. The top of the handle, the back of the handle end, the base of the handle, the dark area on the wood under Craftsman, the rest of the handle, the, wood, the woody part of the handle, the edge of the blade, the shaft portion of metal blade, the back of the shaft of the metal blade. So I took samples basically from, mostly from the um, blood areas. I swabbed the top and back of the handle, the wooden handle, dark area, the shaft of the blade, the edge of the shovel blade, and the back of the shaft. And, and all those gave indications for blood and all of them were Brandy Peters? I believe they all did give indications for blood, yes. Okay. Well, there were some samples that I got no results. Okay. I should say. All right. Next, let's turn to state's exhibit number 91, uh, Tallahassee Police Department number 75. The swab from the exterior front door. There was blood present on this sample. I developed all 13 markers and they match Brandy Peters. Stage exhibit number 92, uh, which is Tallahassee Police Department number 76, is swab from the ground on front of the entryway. There was blood present on this sample. 
I developed all 13 markers, and it matches Brandy Peters. State's Exhibit number 93, Tallahassee Police Bomber number 77, uh, swabbing from the exterior cast siding near the entryway. There was blood on this sample as well. I developed all 13 markers, and they match Brandy Peters. Um, State's 103U, Tallahassee Police Department number 90, nail clippings from Brandy's right hand. There was blood present on these nail clippings. I developed all 13 markers and it matched Brandy Peters. 103V, uh, Tallahassee Police Department item number 91, nail clippings from Brandy Peters' left hand. There was blood present on this sample. I developed all 13 markers, and it matches Brandy Peters. And 103HH, which is Tallahassee Police Department number 92A, which is the uh, swabbing from Brandy Peters sexual assault kit. There was um, blood present on this swabbing. I examined all of the swabs in the sexual assault kit for semen, did chemical testing and microscopic testing, and the buckle swabs were negative. Okay. Therefore, I did not do DNA testing on them. All right. Um, and again, also part of that state's exhibit 103HH, but it, I think the Tallahassee Police Department number is 92C and D, which would be the oral swab from sexual assault kit and the anal swab from brandy sexual assault kit. Do you do any testing on those? Yes. The oral swabs were positive for blood, uh, but negative for semen. The anal swabs were positive for blood, but negative for semen. And did you do DNA testing on those to make a comparison to Brandy Peters? No, I did not. Okay. Why would you not on those? Well, they came from her, so we're pretty sure her DNA would be on there. Uh, we were looking for something that would be foreign to her, and there was no semen present. so. The policy of FDLE at that time was to not test things that for DNA if there was no semen present. Okay. Right. 103Q, uh, Tallahassee Police Department Exhibit Number 93, which was uh, swabbing from Brandy's right ear. There was blood present on this sample, and I developed all 13 markers, which matched Brandy Peters. State's Exhibit Number 79, which is Tallahassee Police Department Number 118, a gold earring found in the front entryway. The gold earring was positive for blood. I took several uh, samples from this. I tested the, the red-brown stain, which was the blood positive. Um, I did develop all 13 markers, which matched Brandy Peters. I also tested an area of blue staining Sorry. on the earring, on which I got a partial profile of only amylogenin, showing a female, XX. And I swabbed the area of the earring without the blue stain on it. And I, again, I got a partial profile, which matched Brandy Peters. So pretty much all the DNA there basically says Brandy Peters except for one foreign, the Y, correct? On what? On the earring, there's one foreign, the, uh, the, I'm sorry, didn't you say there was a Y that was found there? No. Okay, I apologize. At amylogenin, there was only XX, which okay. indicated female. Okay. There was also a possible hair found on this earring, but it could not be examined because it did not have a root. I could only do DNA testing on the root. Explain that, please. Um, part of the hair that grows above the root does not have cells in it uh, that contain nuclei with DNA. So only the root is the basically living part of a hair, and that's the part that we need to test if we're going to be able to develop DNA. Okay. Next, we have State's Exhibit Number 66, Tallahassee Police Department Number 129, a suspected blood. Uh, from the back of the tub in the common bathroom. Um, there was uh, positive indications for blood. I was able to develop a partial profile, which matched Brandy Peters, but there was a foreign allele at 
or mixture at one of the loci. Okay. A swabbing of the bathroom uh, door handle states exhibit number 67, Tallahassee Police Department exhibit number 130. This was also positive for blood. I was able to develop a partial profile and this indicated a mixture. It appeared to be a mixture of Randy Peters and Tamaya Tanaya Peters. They are included. Um, Javante was excluded. And there is also a Y present. Which indicates a possible male, correct? Correct. Or would indicate a male. I did compare this to Henry Segura, and he was excluded. Okay. States exhibit number 83, uh, TPD exhibit number 137, the swab from the front entry wall. This again was positive for blood. I developed all 13 markers, and it matched Brandy Peters. States exhibit number 84, uh, TPD 138, a swab of the interior front door. This also was positive for blood. I developed all 13 markers and it matched Brandy Peters. States exhibit number 85, um, TPD number 139. This was also positive for blood and I developed all 13 markers which matched Brandy Peters. And that was a uh, swab from the west entry wall, correct? That's correct. State's exhibit number 94, Tallahassee Police Department, number 145, a swab from the front porch area left of the door. This was positive for blood. I developed all 13 markers, and it matched Brandy Peters. State's exhibit number 86, Tallahassee Police Department number 143, a swab from the artificial tree that was found in the living room. This also tested positive for blood. It was a partial profile, but it matched Brandy Peters. Now, earlier you talked about some hair clippings that were, or some hair that was not analyzed. Um, State's exhibit number 103R. Uh, tell us, police department number 62, a hair from a left pinky. Uh, states exhibit 103S, tell us, police department 63, hair from a right nail. And states exhibit 103T, tell us, police department 64, hair from a right pinky. Were those similar situated where they were hairs that were not suitable for analysis? Yes, that's correct. Um, earlier we talked about some of the uh, scrapings that were done from fingernails. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about some other ones if we can. Uh, 103C, which is Tallahassee Police Department number 48, which I believe is a scraping from the right middle nail. All right, I developed all 13 markers from that. Um, it matched Brandy Peters, but there is a foreign donor at one of the markers. One hundred three H, Tallahassee Police Department number fifty three, a scraping from the left middle nail. I was able to develop all thirteen markers, and it matched Brandy Peters, but there are four uh, alleles at three of the different markers. And one hundred three I, Tallahassee Police Department number fifty four, scraping from the right ring nail. I was able to develop all thirteen markers. And it matched Brandy Peters, but there is a foreign donor at one, oh yeah, uh, one locus. And those, uh, and those foreign that you're talking about there, are they consistent with being your female, a second female? Um, yes, there's no Y present, so I would not say there was a male there. And again, not really able to determine where it is. Uh, I believe Miss Peters had uh, false nails, could have been from a nail technician or something along those lines, really there's no way to say when that DNA was left, correct? That's correct. I believe you also analyzed um, 
the phone's in the toilet in the in the house, and uh, there was a male that was identified, but not insufficient for any comparison purposes. Is that correct? Um, which exhibit would that be? Uh, actually, I didn't write it down. Um, give me one moment. find that in a minute and come back to it. Um, let's move on if we can. Uh, state's exhibit number 17, Tallahassee Police Department number 8, which is a swab from the front, front, I'm sorry, from the floor in the hallway in front of the common bathroom. Yes, I, I tested this for blood. It was positive, and I developed all 13 markers, which was a mixture. The major component matched uh, Tanaya and Tamaya. Um, Javante and Brandy were excluded. Did that, did that give any indications for blood? Yes. Okay. I might have missed it. I apologize. So it was blood, and it uh, that would be positive for Tanaya and Tamaya. It's a mixture, but they are the major component. Okay. Um, next, let's turn to the uh, state's exhibit number 58, Tallahassee Police Department number 28, which is the exterior door frame of the common bathroom. Um, I tested that for blood. It was positive. I developed all 13 markers, and the profile matches Tanai and Tamaya. State's Exhibit number 60, Tallahassee Police Department number 53, swab of the left hand of the child with the white sandals. Is it 53 or 43? 43, excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, that also gave indications for blood. Um, there were all 13 markers developed, which matches Tanaya and Tamaya. However, there was a Y present as well. So no, again, a male. Correct. State's exhibit number 72, Tallahassee Police Department number 45, the swab of the middle cushion from the couch. That also gave positive indications for blood. All 13 markers were developed, which matches Tanaya and Tamaya. So, Tamaya Tanaya is blood. Correct. State's Exhibit number 68, Tallahassee Police Department number 131, the interior hall bathroom doorknob. There was no red-brown staining on this swab. I was able to develop a partial DNA profile and at only one Locus and Tanai and Tamaya are included. And turning back now, if we can, I'm showing you uh, a photograph here. State's exhibit number 66 and 129. Um, you did testing on that, correct? What was the. State's exhibit number 66, Tallahassee Police Department number 129. Um, swab of suspected blood on the back of the tub wall. Yes, sir. Yes, I did, and it was positive for blood. I developed a partial profile, which matched Brandy Peters, and there was a mixture at one locus. So we're talking about right in this area right here. Now, did you also do a comparison as it relates to a swab of the grab bar here, which is State's Exhibit number 63, Tell us, Police Department number 126? Yes. There was no red-brown staining on this, so I did not test it for blood. I developed a partial profile. It appeared to be a mixture of three or more people. 
All of the victims are included in that. And there are two starred alleles, again, between 50 and 100 RFUs, that are foreign to all of the victims. And, again, we're talking about the starred alleles at two different locations, correct? That's correct. All right. Um, and you had Henry Segura's DNA. Um, and those starred alleles are, you can't make calls based upon the FDLE protocols, correct? They could be used for exclusion. But they not cannot inclusion. be used for inclusion. Okay. And did you also make comparisons as it relates to Henry Segura using that chart that we talked about in State's Exhibit Number 148? Yes. I had to say that I could not determine. There was no determination for Henry Segura. Okay. So you could not exclude him is what you're saying? Correct. Okay. And I, I understand that the RFUs are too low for calling purposes for um, the... Florida Department of Law Enforcement, but as it relates to those two alleles, were they consistent um, with Henry Segura's DNA? At one of the low side, there was a starred allele at D8, which was a 16. And Mr. Segura's type is 1216 at that locus. At the D5 locus, there was a starred allele that was 12, that was foreign to the victims. Uh, Mr. Segura's type at that locus is 1214. So it would be consistent with Mr. Segura's DNA? I can't make any conclusions. I understand. But that's why you couldn't exclude him, correct? Correct. So as I understand it, uh, for the most part, your analysis, or not for the most part, but the entirety of your analysis, uh, essentially um, you can say... Who was included as relates to Brandy Peters, Tamaya, Tanaya Peters, and Henry and Javante Segura? In some cases, you found evidence of other donors, but the data basically was insufficient to be used for inclusion purposes uh, if any donor was eventually identified, correct? Later on, I got, um, sorry, um, later on, I got uh, standards from other family members and I was able to compare them to all the different uh, foreign profiles that were callable. And sometimes I could include them or exclude them. Uh, but that's a fair summation of all the DNA that we've just talked about that, um, again, you can make identifications as it relates to Tamaya, Tanaya, Brandy, Javante. Um, but for the most part, any of the foreign alleles that we've talked about um, are either solo RFUs or only one location um, or loci to make them statistically um, irrelevant, if you will. Well, I cannot do any kind of statistics for those start alleles between 50 and 100 RFUs, and that's what most of them were. Okay. All right. One moment. Just for clarification, we talked earlier about the foreign uh, DNA that was found on the child with the white sandals in the bathtub. With my understanding, there was one low side that was different, correct? Um, could you tell me, uh, would that be TPD Exhibit 43? Uh, it's going to be... Stacy did on 60, uh, TPD 43. Um... <clears throat> The little that's foreign is a Y. Okay. So the only thing you know is a male. Correct. Okay. Uh, you were talking about the grab bar. I think you misstated the number. Mr. So 63. Uh, it's, 
stated. State's Exhibit Number 63, Tallahassee Police Department Number 126 should be that referring to for the grab bar. That wasn't the number you just gave me. No, that was a different one. That was for the child. Okay. That was State's Exhibit Number 60, Tallahassee Police Department Number 43, which is the swab from the left hand of the child with white sandals. No further questions. Are you going to have some frost, Mr. Frank? Why don't we go ahead and take a lunch break? Does that cause you a problem? No, sir. That's what I was saying. All right. Why don't we go ahead and take a lunch break? Let's be back ready to go at 1 o'clock. Have a good lunch. Either there side anything? There you are. There you are. All right. We'll see you all at 1 o'clock. May I leave my phone, too?